Thanks for choosing to listen to Inciting Incidents. The stories you're about to hear are captured in the book, Inciting Incidents, by Moody Publishers. To read these stories and others in their entirety, buy the book Inciting Incidents at your favorite online or local bookstore. Now, enjoy the program. An inciting incident is uh, something that happens in a story that um, sets a plot into motion. It's a moment in a character's life that upsets the balance and uh, moves them into one direction or another. And it's pivotal um, in a story structure. Without the inciting incident, uh, a story can't happen. Like an event, a circumstance or situation that arises that kind of creates uh, or puts a fork in the road that comes into vision, and all of a sudden you have this aha moment. The inciting incident. A catalyst, a game changer. It could be something large or small in life, a boulder in the road, or a simple snapshot. A moment in time caught and preserved in that life forever. After the moment, whether you realize it then or not, everything is different. It could take years to understand this was the moment your life changed, or you might recognize it immediately. You probably have an inciting incident in your life. As you listen to the four stories we'll present today, think about yours. There are four snapshots, four moments in time we'll preserve for you from the lives of our guests. For Tracy, it was in the upstairs bathroom. The shower represents a before and after she'll never forget. Blaine was in a car heading for a show. He's an actor. His inciting incident happened on Interstate 90 near Chicago. Jeff was walking over a bridge in Spain when someone said something so striking, so unnerving, that he had to turn around. And for David... Well, David's story is a little tricky. He was attending a meeting where a popular author and motivational speaker was pontificating. That moment uh, was really the key factor in my life. It, it, it's, it's kind of the, the before the conference and after the conference. Everything is kind of based on this moment. The stories you're about to hear may relate to your life, may help you make sense of the place where you are. A place of being stuck, perhaps. A place where you may feel imprisoned. The good news is, the inciting incident of your life can bring freedom if you'll let it. Instead of staying where you are, that incident can propel you closer to God and closer to the person He wants you to become. I'm Chris Fabry, and the stories you're about to hear are detailed in a book called Inciting Incidents. You can find out more at the website, moodyradio.org. The first thing you should know about me is that I'm a ghost. Meet David Wenzel, a creative guy, really creative. A man who works with other creative people. You've probably seen his work and didn't even know it. As a story consultant, we work with people who, who know their own story. They, they have been developing their brand. They know who they are as as individuals, but at the same time, they need help figuring out where their story kind of fits into the world. So we, myself and my business partners, um, help them develop their own story. Uh, And what that means is we oftentimes are helping them write scripts, we're oftentimes helping them develop their online persona, we're helping them develop all sorts of aspects about their project that really just comes across as they are. Um, And so one of the key things that I do is I develop a lot of the early content and a lot of the uh, actual ghostwriting. So it might be one of our clients that I'm actually writing a book for, um, and that the, the term for that is ghostwriter. So I've been a part of a variety of projects, um, everything from NUMA to a, a film series with Francis Chan or Tim Keller or Marcus Buckingham, where my, uh, my contribution has been um, sizable, but uh, we're never listed as being a part of the project. So that's kind of where the term a ghostwriter comes from. David's career has been about the arc of people's lives, other people's lives. Story is one of the key things in my life. 
I've realized over time I've I've had I've been so drawn to the concept of story, but I don't feel that I'm a writer. I'm not a director. I'm not a um, I'm not a, a creative storyteller in a sense. But at the same time, I'm so drawn to the the idea of uh, be it a biblical story or a uh, an average person walking down the road. Like all of these stories are so key to me. And I've, I've had a hard time figuring out how I fit into that. So my entire life, you know, I studied marketing in college. I studied psychology in college. What I, re- what I really wanted to do was understand why people do the things that they do. That was one of the key things that I discovered that I, I really wanted to know. Not a matter of, you know, why does the protagonist do this? Why does the antagonist do this? What I really wanted to, to learn was, was why. What's the motivation behind them? And so that became the motive. That became the motives for why people st- tell the stories that they do tell. And that's what I was fascinated with. So whenever we work on a project with somebody, um, I always like to understand where is the story coming from? Like, why are you telling the story? Why are you better at telling the story than somebody else? And so that's my first question is, what's the motive? Why are you telling the story? And um, I realized that it's kind of a uh, an issue with my own life that I have a story that I want to tell, but I feel like I've never really been able to tell it. And so a maybe a self-handicapping thing that I have is that I like to tell other people's stories. I find that um, I very much downplay what's going on in my life and upplay what's going on in somebody else's life and talking about uh, their story, where they're coming from, what they want to accomplish, where they're going, what their goals are. Um, Because I felt for a long time that I really didn't have a story that was worth telling but a few years ago, just things happened in my life that just kind of changed that whole concept of, uh, of what kind of story I do or don't have to tell. But the one millimeter change, I'll show you one of them right now. Check this out. Stay in the state of certainty. Some of you lost it. Intensify it. Whatever it takes. Intensify it. Make your move. Come on. Make your move. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Tony Robbins is an evangelist for success. Back in July, his seminar got in hot water after some of his conference attendees walked across hot coals. More than a dozen suffered second and third degree burns. He's a self-help motivational speaker who gives seminars around the country, around the world. And it was at this unlikely event that David found his inciting incident. So I met this expert conference for about four days in San Francisco. And I, I'm really not a big fan of these conferences, to be honest. I, I'm not a, I'm not a big, like, go there and hug everybody and yell things and clap. And, you know, it's just a very, uh, it's not, that's not my style, but nevertheless, I'm there. One of the first things that people ask at this conference is, well, what are you an expert in? And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the majority of people there are experts in nutrition or uh, chiropractic therapy or water hydration or Pilates, you know, everybody is an expert in something. And then there's me and I'm kind of an expert in helping other experts. So uh, literally from the beginning, people say, oh, what are you an expert in? And I try try to explain that I help experts become better experts because that's actually what, you know, Dot and Cross, my company, and now Robin Hood Inc. uh, does. The first speaker that day outlined the way to become an expert, how to get noticed, how to rise above the competition. And then Tony Robbins told those in attendance something shocking, something mind-blowing that contradicted the first speaker. At an expert conference, he actually says, forget about being coming an expert. There's, there's, there's nothing good that can come of it. He goes, what you need to become is an authority. And like a light bulb went off in my head when I heard this. I was like, that's it. That's what I need. He's trying to explain, the, you know, the, the first guy was trying to explain how you can beat the system, how you can just get to an expert really quickly. You can set yourself up and make money and show how you're different from all these people. And he's saying, uh, no, that's not how you do it at all. When you become an authority, um, it's your personal experiences that make you an authority. Nobody can take away your memories. Nobody can take away the pain you suffered. Nobody can take away the victories that you fought for. Nobody can take away... Um, the struggles that you faced in an ongoing journey. And this is, it's almost like what Malcolm Gladwell says, when you put in your 10,000 hours, that's where you start to become an expert at something, as opposed to the, the previous guy who's like, hey, you can, you can do this really simply, you know, just, uh, just figure a few things out. And literally at the end of it, he kind of alpha wolfed us. He said, if you give me one month, 
you choose the area of topic, I will out expert you. He's like, I can go online, I can learn more information about you, I will I will know more about your field of study in one month than you. And he essentially issued a challenge. He's like, does anybody want to challenge me? And of course we were all, you know, scared. We're like, no, we're not gonna challenge Tony Robbins. But what he said was, it doesn't matter what type of expert you want to be. He goes, what truly matters is the type of authority uh, that you carry with you. And and when he said that, that changed it. And so a lot of what I learned, you know, previous to this moment was the difference between being an expert in something and knowing the information versus being an authority in something and having wisdom in something and having more than just information, but having wisdom to apply to life based on your own personal experiences. And, um, and that was like just a key moment for me in life. Everything was kind of laid on the table at that one moment. And I kind of saw two different pathways for myself. One was this pathway of becoming an expert and knowing all the answers and, and creating controversy. And this is the best way to do it based on my study versus the other road of becoming an authority and, and just doing the work and doing really great work and letting people see you uh, for what you truly are and not having to tell people to follow you that people will naturally follow the authorities once they see them in their own life. And, and so I was 27 years old at the time and I really saw these two things laid on the table and, and knew that <laughs> I had to make a decision which one of those two people I wanted to be. 27 years old and the pathway was laid out for David clearly a turning point for him. But there was a twist to this inciting incident. It happened on the night before the conference ended, something unexpected, something life-changing. We'll hear more of David's story in a moment. Again, you can read his entire account of his inciting incident, as well as others, in the book titled Inciting Incidents. Find out more at moodyradio.org. I was 17 years old, and I just started my junior year of high school. Um, I was a complete procrastinator. I think I am still. And, um, you know, I was getting ready for picture day the next day. It was, the, again, the beginning of my junior year. So I had my nightly routine of not doing any homework and, you know, watching TV and talking to my friends. And around 11 o'clock, um, I was going to take my nightly shower because I'm not a morning person, so I was not going to take a morning shower. Meet Tracy Persico, reliving her inciting incident. A typical teenager then, doing what she'd done just about every night of her life. Until that night. Until that shower. So I went into my nightly shower, and everything was the same. All nightly routines were in place. And then when I stepped out of the shower, everything had changed. My mother was out of her bed. The lights were on in her bedroom. TV was off. She uh, was on the phone with my older brother, asking him to come home. He was at a local college. Um, My father was nowhere to be found. Our front door was wide open, and I had no idea what just happened. It was like a 30-minute shower had just changed uh, my life. So I ran downstairs, and I asked my mom, you know, what's going on, and... um, she sat me down and, and after she got off the phone with my brother um, and said that my father had decided right then and there to come upstairs before he went to bed that he could not be in the marriage anymore, that he had decided that was the time that he was going to leave. Um, and that was just heartbreaking for me that uh, he confessed to a, a two-year affair that he was having, um, which my mother had known two years prior, had talked to him about, but... You know, it continued on. But I, and I didn't understand why at that moment, why at the end of the day, why at 11 o'clock at night was that the decision? And why did he wait till I went into the shower and not talk to both of us at the same time? Like, was I not worth um, saying that to as well? Was I not worth saying that he was not just done with the marriage, but he was also done with our family when he walked out the door? And that's when he walked out. He walked out at 1130 one night and... Uh, Came back early the next morning. I had gotten maybe two hours of sleep um, and then woke up, wanted to get a piece of his clothing. So I ran to his closet around 7.30 and I uh, already found that his closet had cl- been cleaned out. He'd come back early, even earlier than uh, I was sleeping and cleaned out his whole closet. And I did not even get one stitch of clothing from him. And he had already left again. I felt like I'd, I'd missed the chance to even say goodbye 
a second time or was not given the opportunity to hear the truth or to hear what he was thinking. So it just felt like a dagger within a, you know, a double dagger within 24 hours of not having um, explanation, not sort of being worth an explanation and not giving the chance to have closure or say goodbye or, or hear any of that. I wanted a piece of my father's clothing because I felt like that was one thing that I had. If I could just have one tangible thing uh, of his that I would remind me that he was there, that you know, he, it sort of happened so fast and he became sort of this phantom person that I just kept missing, like I just couldn't see or catch up with. Um, and so I just wanted one thing to hold on to and, and I didn't know when I would be able to get to see him again or when we would have a conversation or when he would come back or if he would come back. And so I just felt like I needed one tangible thing to hold on to. Tracy's crisis moment, her inciting incident, had come on the heels of a spiritual awakening and a realization that God's forgiveness changes everything. I had literally just met the Lord probably three months before my father had made that decision. I did not grow up in a Christian home. Um, so I actually met the Lord through an organization called Young Life and had just gone on a, a weekend with them and had heard the gospel for the first time. And um, I had gone to church, you know, earlier on, um, but just felt like it was very dry. It was very non-personal. But this guy got up there and was talking about the state of our hearts and how we are separated from the Lord and um, was talking about forgiveness and, and bridging the gap and that Christ died for our sins. And it just sort of created this moment of like, oh my gosh, my life is empty and I've been trying to fill it with friends and guys and popularity and sports and um, all these things that a high school kid you know, tries to deem as cool and deem as, you know, life-giving or what life looks like. But then being presented with the state of the heart, it was, it created this sort of fork in the road for me of, I need to make some better decisions because what I'm doing and the decisions I'm making are only leading me down this uh, road of death and more separation from God. And so I'd been sort of introduced to this idea of forgiveness in my 17-year-old brain was grasping it in terms of making minor life choices that were different, like, um, you know, doing my homework or, you know, spending more time with Christian friends or going to youth group or, you know, making minor decisions that were different. But then coming in contact with this huge life-changing incident uh, that presented a larger sin, so to speak, than what I was doing in high school. And... I didn't really understand or grasp the concept of forgiveness that could be that big. Like, I didn't know how to reconcile this God who could forgive me for what I thought was these minor sins, and then how was God going to forgive my dad? Like, how could he forgive somebody who just wrecked our family and changed my life forever, and there's no going back on that? And so where is God in the midst of that? I think inciting instances don't change where life comes from. Like we can either still choose God in the midst of that or we don't. And we can still have that fork in the road of saying, you know what, I'm going to take control of my own life. I'm going to self-medicate. I'm going to choose what I think is still life-giving. Or we can choose God and saying, you know what, I, I caught a glimpse of redemption. I caught a glimpse of forgiveness and I caught a glimpse of what life could be like and how different it is. And I mean, God is all heart. Like he is in our heart. He changes our heart. And um, that matters. That is where the healing happens. And so I had a decision to make. I had a fork in the road and had to decide which life am I going to go down? Which road am I going to choose? A fork in the road will do that, force you to choose. And not choosing is a choice as well. If you disregard the fork, you've made a choice. But let's go back to David at the expert conference, who was laid low by this concept of being an authority rather than an expert. He got together with some friends that night at the hotel and decided he would be cagey with his expertise and have some fun. But the results were disastrous in one way. In another, it was the catalyst that led him on an odyssey of discovery. 
One of the first things they asked was, uh, what are you an expert in? And of course I said, well, I'm a, I'm a kung fu expert. And apparently one of them there actually was a kung fu expert. And so he went to give me this kind of uh, fake roundhouse kick to the head. And of course, everybody's kind of laughing now. And now we're, now we're kind of playing to the audience a little bit. And so sure enough, he delivered this kind of fake roundhouse kick. And I turned really quickly as though he'd hit me. And I hit my head on this concrete pillar. And, uh, and I turned around and I, everybody was just, oh, you know, everybody knew that that probably hurt pretty bad. And it, and it did, it hurt, it hurt pretty bad, but I, I hit myself kind of on the front left portion of my, of my head and, uh, it hurt. It wasn't too bad though, but I turned around and, uh, was just, you know, going to kind of play it off. But when I did, um, nothing would come out of my mouth. I couldn't speak, and it was really bizarre. Like, I've never actually had that, uh, and, and the medical term for it is called aphasia. My brain was working, and I'm like, tell him your name. Your name is David. Tell him, tell him your company. Your company is, is Dot & Cross. Tell him this, and nothing would come out of my mouth. It was a very, very bizarre feeling, and I've never been short on words, so I, I, I literally didn't know what to do, and I would literally kind of try and push words out of my mouth, and the only word that would come out was this, uh, almost like a like a child trying to say the word concrete. Like I, I that was the only word I could get out of my mouth. And they were all being very nice. Like it's okay, take your time. You just hit your head. You know, people are like, well, maybe he has a concussion and all this stuff. And I was just so embarrassed. I I wanted to get out of there as quickly as I could. And eventually, I kind of came around to where I could kind of mumble a few phrases. And I was like, I need to go to bed. Like I need to get out of here. Um, and I was really just embarrassed at the fact that I couldn't talk and I didn't know what was happening. And um, and I'd also noticed a, a numbness down the right side of my body that was very bizarre. And um, so this is this is new territory for me. I've never experienced any of these feelings before, and I just wanted to get out of there. So I went up and went to bed. And um, when I woke up in the morning, um, I felt fine for the most part. I had a little bit of a headache, but when I went to take a shower that morning, when I was in the shower, I realized I couldn't talk again. This the same feeling was coming back. I can't talk. Um, I had a really strong metallic taste in my mouth and it was overwhelming. I just kept spitting this metallic taste out of my mouth and that numbing feeling on the right side of my body came back. And I was just, again, I was just kind of blown away at um, what was happening to me. And uh, sure enough, a couple minutes later, it kind of passed and I was like, okay, I'm all right. I'm all right. Like moving on, like, let's go downstairs. Let's pretend this never happened. Let's, let's press on. And so I went down, it was the final day of the conference and um, it was about nine o'clock in the morning and uh, I sat down and I don't really remember too much other than, you know, welcome, this is the final day. And right at that moment, I had a grand mal seizure. When every muscle on your body tenses up, you know, you typically, you pass out, you start seizing, your, your, your muscles start tensing up. Um, and I was on the ground just shaking for about five minutes. Uh, completely, completely out of, you know, completely unconscious. Um, when uh, and then I was passed out for about 25 minutes after that. So I was I was unconscious for about 30 minutes, um, and woke up when they were loading me into a ambulance headed for Stanford Hospital, and really had no idea what had just happened. When I first got to the hospital, they thought that I had some internal bleeding from hitting my head on this concrete pillar. And so they ran some MRIs, they ran some PET scans, they, they kind of wanted to just do an overview of my body. And, um, and I'm, I'm joking around, you know, I'm feeling fine at this point in time. Um, and when they uh, came back to me, they said, David, you don't have bleeding on the brain, but you actually have a very large cancerous tumor in your head. And this just, of course, I was I was in shock. They said, yeah, he started showing me the, the MRIs and showing me that there's this large mass. And I don't think they said cancerous at first, but you have a large mass in your head that we need to do a biopsy on. And so uh, they ended up, we, I transferred from Stanford over to Mayo in, in Minnesota, and they did a biopsy there and learned that I have a grade two oligoastrocytoma, uh, which is a, a glioma in the brain 
and it's not a little it's not a little tumor that you can a lot of people go in and they'll remove this little piece of of tumor mine is actually like tree branches and so these tree branches actually move throughout my brain and goes through my my vernikes and my broca's section of the brain which is your speech comprehension and operation portions of your brain and that's also right next to my my right motor cortex so when when I hit my head, what I essentially did was, you know, I, I caused some swelling, but it was right on the outside of where this tumor was living that I had no idea was there. And it caused this little bit of swelling, which caused the tumor to move, which then affected my, my right motor cortex and then affected my ability to speak and to understand. And so right then I essentially set off this uh, this tumor. I, I essentially pushed, <laughs> I don't know how you say it. I. I realized for the first time that something was there. And they said that this, based on the calcium that was in my brain, it had probably been growing in my brain for about 10 years, um, which was just so bizarre for me to hear that for the past 10 years I've had cancer in my brain and never knew it until this moment at this conference, right when my life had kind of been turned upside down by some of the information I was hearing. And all of a sudden I went from the guy angry at God because I've never been given this, any type of story, any type of story that was worth listening to, to now being the guy who has his brain, 25% of his brain is covered in a cancerous tumor that they say will allow me only five to seven years uh, left to live. A bump on the head leads to a diagnosis. The inciting incident forces David to make some tough decisions about life, about faith. But others reach this crisis point through different means, from differing paths, like I-90 near Chicago. A young man is driving to another show. He's an actor on the cusp of something big. Already successful in his stage career, the future looks bright and promising. And it's not a tumor or a divorce or an accident that changes it. It's as simple as a thought that crosses his mind. This is where we'll pick up the story of Blaine Hogan. All my life, since I was 18, um, really since I finished high school, all I wanted to do was uh, be an actor. I went to a couple different uh, theater schools, ended up here in Chicago, was in New York for a while, came back to Chicago, and really was taking off. Had a great agent, was working at a lot of theaters, Marriott Chicago Shakespeare, working at the Goodman, and it looked like everything was kind of up and to the right. Um, meanwhile, I had the classic story of um, just had a lot of issues, kind of junk going on, stuff from my childhood that was um, really b making itself known, really becoming much more present. And I remember a day, it must have been October, driving down 90, and a beautiful October day, heading uh, downtown to do a show, and just had this sense of, um, like, is this it? Is this everything? Is this what I should be doing? And it wasn't like a kind of, I don't want to be part of the entertainment industry. Um, I just, there was this gnawing feeling that I needed to maybe finally come to terms with some of the issues that I was dealing with. And it was that moment that I was given a really pretty clear example of like, I could keep doing this one thing, but if these issues were uh, go uh, went unaddressed, um, I was going to implode or I was going to explode. So from that moment, I spun out of control, ended up in the emergency room with really severe anxiety and panic attacks. And this is what happens, and it's what I've uh, dubbed my inciting incident. It's a moment in a character's life uh, that radically upsets it. And just me thinking, is there more, was for me uh, the inciting incident that really upset everything. And um, from there, everything changed. I think that I had been lucky enough to taste a bit of, of real success, what I really had hoped for, and I think I, I was left wanting more. Well, this, isn't, this didn't do what I thought it was going to do, and it's so, it's so cliche, and I wish it weren't so, but stories are all the same. You realize that something is missing, and nothing can quite fill it, and um, 
I mean, as cliche as it was, that's that's what it that's that's what was happening. I grew up Catholic, and so I'd always been exposed to spirituality in a number of different facets, specifically the Catholic faith. But I was the kid that sort of all my high school friends took me to their youth groups. So I went to like Lutheran Bible camp. I went to Assemblies of God youth groups. Um, I went to Billy Graham crusades. Um, and I was always the kid who raised my hand. So I was like an altar call junkie. And the high always wore off. And uh, so I'd, I'd always maintained a, uh, what I called the Christian faith, but uh, I wouldn't say I was living it out. I think that I, I, I always felt the presence of God, especially in those really dark moments. Um, but I couldn't have claimed that I was living um, much of a Christian walk at that point. The thought that crossed Blaine's mind didn't just appear without a reason— It was from seeds sown many years before in his life. The summer of my 10th year, um, I was sexually abused by a couple of older guys in my neighborhood. And uh, in the story, I write that um, it began to build a storm um, that didn't quite break until the moment on 90, 10 or so years later, that October. And since then, I've been sort of dealing with that storm. I think for a long time, I had this idea of God as um, someone that I could participate with whenever I wanted to. So I had this picture in my mind that I would say, "Uh, God, thanks so much for being with me today, but I'm now going to do something you probably shouldn't see. And I would like literally have in my mind that I could shut the door on God. And I'd been doing some study recently and um, uh, on David. And he wrote Psalm 139, where he's talking about where can I go from your presence? You know, if I go up to the heavens, if I go make my bed in the depths, you're there. Well, some scholars say that he wrote that when he was a kid. And then you look at the rest of his life, his sleeping with Bathsheba and all the things that he did. And it's ironic to think that a guy who wrote those words thought that he could get away with something as dramatic as that. And... I, I think that's sort of how I live my life, is that even though I'd been told again and again, God knows you, he, he's with you in those dark places, he's, he's with you um, in the beauty, he's with you in the depravity, I had this mind that I could separate it. And so what I was really coming to terms with in the emergency room and curled up in a ball on my floor, you know, dealing with this intense anxiety was that God was with me in this moment. He was with me in the moments that I said, God, uh, please don't be with me. And what was really difficult was having to wrestle with the idea that God was with me in the moment of my own abuse. And um, I think that all of those kind of intermingling together, those can take you into some really dark places, and that's where I found myself. In the book, Inciting Incidents, Blaine Hogan reveals a vision of his life after the inciting incident, after the panic attacks, after he decided to go to school in the Pacific Northwest. Here is what he wrote. As I sat in a corner annex of the school, trying dreadfully to calm myself down, I penned these words on a battered field notes notebook I'd been keeping in my pocket as I worked through my feelings those first few months. It snowed 13 inches today, and I missed it. Oh, I was there, all right. I saw it snowing, but still, I missed it. God's blanket of white, pure white, gently pressed down the pause button of our busy, busy souls. All he wanted to say was, see, look what I can do. Don't you think it's lovely? Wildly, I flung my hands about, beat my chest, screamed a ton, and then began furiously shoveling off the snow that threatened to depress my heart's little switch. No, no, I do not think it's lovely. No, I say, I will not be stopped. I will not look. I will not see. I have a life to live, and these 13 inches are giving me a panic attack. I do not want to be stuck, stranded, stopped. So please... Pack your snow back up and drop it on someone else's heart who might care. 
Someone who might actually stop and give you praise for interrupting their perfectly busy lives. It snowed today. 13 inches in Seattle. It was beautiful, I'm told. The tumor had been growing in David's brain for a decade. The affair Tracy's father had been engaged in had been going on for years, undetected. The abuse Blaine received had happened a decade earlier as well. All inciting incidents that force those going through these experiences to choose, to change. As they said at the beginning, an inciting incident is something in a character's life that upsets the balance, that provides a fork in the road, an opportunity that you wouldn't wish for, but that can be used for great good in your life. You can read more about the stories you're hearing today in the book, Inciting Incidents. Find out more at moodyradio.org. There you'll read about David, Blaine, Tracy, and Jeff Goins. Pain is uh, always uh, part of how we grow, and and certainly there is uh, inexplicable pain in our lives, things that uh, happen, uh, ways in which we suffer that we don't really understand, and, and I'm not interested in explaining those things away. When I look back at the moments in my life where I've grown the most, I've been the least comfortable. And and I think there's two types of pain. There's the uh, type of pain that's more like suffering where uh, there's not really an explanation for it and there's some sort of evil or malignant force behind it. Uh, and so that's one type of pain. Another type of pain is, you know, kind of the pain that you feel when you're working out, when your muscles are growing. And I think more often than not, uh, when I'm growing, that's the type of pain that I'm feeling. It's the, uh, you know, do I have to uh, type pain? Do I have to do this? I know it's good for me, but I really don't want to. And I know that when I'm done, I'll be glad that I did it. But there's this initial uh, resistance that I feel before I actually do it. If it sounds academic, it's not. What Jeff experienced on a bridge in Spain was not academic, but a snapshot in time he will never forget. I remember the moment when uh, my life literally changed in an evening where how I looked at the world uh, dramatically shifted from focusing primarily on me and my own interests and needs and wants to being more concerned with um, the needy. And it, it happened one night while I was crossing a bridge in Spain where I was studying abroad during college. And uh, earlier that evening, my friends and I had met this beggar man who uh, came up to us and asked us for money. And he stood on this street corner and was screaming at us. Uh, He started asking us for money. And and as we uh, first ignored him, then told him we'd come back later and eventually just kept walking on, he started screaming at us, for the love of Jesus Christ, help me. We'd never experienced that before. I grew up in the Midwest and Grew up in rural Illinois and just wasn't really acquainted with um, urban poverty. And so this uh, took me aback and I did what most people do when they're uncomfortable. I ignored it. I walked away. And as I was crossing the bridge, I remembered this phrase that this man kept saying. He kept saying, for the love of Jesus Christ, please help me. And I don't know if he was just trying to tug on our heartstrings or what, but um, that phrase just kept reverberating in my mind. And I got about halfway across the bridge and I just felt sick to my stomach. And so I gave my backpack to my roommate and I said, go on ahead without me. I'll, uh, I'll be late for supper, but I'll, I'll be by... Later this evening, I just got to take care of something. And he saw in my eyes that I needed to do something, and I think he probably knew what it was. And so I just turned around and I started running. And I uh, ran back to try to find the man, and he had disappeared from where we saw him. And and so I searched and searched, and finally I found him crouched out over in uh, an alley, uh, smoking a cigarette, and I asked him if he wanted to have some dinner with me. His name was Micah, which I found out later. We went over to the nearby McDonald's, and he ordered a um, 
Big Mac and fries and and a beer. And uh, he looked at me and said, I, "I'm I'm sorry. I, that's just what I'd really like." And so I said, "Okay." And so we sat down and and shared this meal together. And then he said something that really surprised me and even shocked me. Yeah, with a mouthful of French fries, he said, "You were the only one." And I didn't know what he meant. I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "You were the only one who has stopped. I've been." sitting here uh, on this corner every night for months. And it turns out he was a German immigrant who couldn't get back into his country because he had lost his papers. And he said, I've been pleading with people to stop and help me or you know, give me money for a meal or something, and nobody has stopped. You're the only one. And that just changed something in me. It really wrecked me. I think when we pass somebody on the street, you know, or, or, or drive past somebody who's, whose car is broken down or a homeless person asking for money or somebody who's in need and we have the power to meet that need, we tell ourselves this nice polite lie, which is that somebody else uh, who's better than me, who's, you know, uh, more uh, moral or a better Christian than me is going to stop and help that person. Surely somebody will do it, just not me. And what I learned that night is sometimes there are some people that we come across, some situations that we encounter where there is nobody else, where we are the person that is intended to help that person. And I had to turn around. Jeff returned to the States, returned to normal life. But Micah, the man on the bridge, stuck with him. And in Nashville, of all places, he met another man who opened his eyes to the truth. My impression of homeless people was they didn't have a home, and I found out that wasn't true. And he showed me this area where he and a group of his friends lived, uh, literally underneath the city in this man-made cave that was carved out of this wall of concrete. And and a friend and I visited them and just got to know them and hear their stories, and we started visiting them regularly about once a week, and we even got to celebrate Christmas with them. And at one point, I I was visiting them, and I was down below the city, and for some reason I glanced up at um, the surface because we were we were underneath the street, and I and I could see people walking by on the street, but they couldn't see me. And and I realized um, just a, a few weeks before I was I was like those people. I was walking up above, unaware of the world beneath me. And it took um, a homeless guy named Steve to help me have the eyes to see another world. And I realized that what Mother Teresa said was true. Um, Calcutta, areas of great need and opportunity for us to serve uh, literally are everywhere. We just need help seeing them. This for me is still a daily struggle. Um, For a while, I thought that I needed to replicate these experiences. And so um, after Spain, I I tried to... um, do things like I had done there and I found myself disappointed and and even growing disillusioned. And and the same thing happened in Nashville after I met Steve. I I tried to recreate these experiences because frankly, they gave me a bit of a a thrill. It it felt good to do good. And uh, what I experienced was sort of this law of diminishing returns. And it took a while, but I began to realize that the thing that, uh, made me come alive, that made me feel alive in those experiences. And and the thing that God was really asking of me was obedience, not to do something in a certain formulaic way, but rather to be open to uh, being moved to a point that I would be willing to do something that is personally uncomfortable for me, but is uh, good for somebody else and and really fulfills um, what I think Christ calls us to do and and be. Uh, God isn't calling us to do, um, you know, a certain type of ministry necessarily for the rest of our lives, but he's calling us to be obedient and open to his voice. And and for for me, that looks like doing hard things, doing things that are initially uncomfortable for me. And because of these experiences, I think I can recognize moments when I'm being called to do something um, better than I could, you know, do on my own. And, uh, and it initially feels like what it felt like on that bridge or when Steve asked us to come see his home, there's this, uh, initial response where I'm scared and, and hesitant. And I understand that 
that's um, an ungodly fear. It's it's not um, it's not wisdom or discretion. It's um, it's fear, and uh, I have an opportunity to make myself a little bit uncomfortable in the short term and be a part of uh, you know God's bigger story in, in the longer term. In any story, especially as a storyteller, you know that what makes a great story is really strong results. So whenever you have that moment where everything changes, you want to say, everything was great, then this bad thing happened, and then it all got better, and and now things are better than what they used to be. That's the results that we want in any story uh, that we tell, uh, that we like to watch on a movie or we like to watch on TV. Um, But this story isn't like that. I'm I'm still in the middle ground. I'm still in the wilderness. I can't say the results to this story are, I overcame cancer or... It was a miracle, and it's completely gone. I can't say any of that because I'm still, I'm still in the middle of it. We all think that we have to be healed in order to provide healing for somebody else. And we have to have it all together, and we have to have our ducks in a row, and we have to have the answers um, in order to provide anyone with any sort of advice or healing or encouragement or even just an honest, I don't know, um, and I love the concept of the wounded healer is because I think I'm, I've, I'm branded with wounding. And it's not just because of a life event. I think we're all human and we hurt in every season of our life. Like we just are in the midst of a culture of pain. We're sinful people and we hurt each other. And we're constantly in a state of asking for forgiveness and understanding grace. And that we never know the things that we're learning and the things that we're presently going through, where that will sort of line up in somebody else's journey and provide encouragement and help and wisdom. What I've been going through is this process of letting go, letting go of control, letting go of knowing what's going to happen next, letting go of what I wanted for my life, letting go of my dreams, letting go of my vision for the future, and essentially saying, God, I'm not writing my story you're writing my story. So I can't control what you want to do with my story. This is up to you. And that process, um, that that resurrection once again of of moving from my story, dying to self and living through Christ, that's the process that I'm almost, I feel I'm almost being forced to go through. And maybe I'm being forced because I didn't want to do it myself. Maybe I'm too stubborn to do it myself. But God said, David, you there's much more that I have for you and I need you, I need your attention. So um, we're going to allow this to happen. But through this process, we are going to kind of rebuild you as a person and give you, give you humility, give you, um, allow you to let go of whatever is holding on to you, that you can learn to follow me and follow me into a new life. I think that we just need to provide freedom for other people to struggle well and to know that we struggle and just to be real in that. I think there's not a lot of freedom in our culture and our society for people to struggle and for people to be okay with that and to have the freedom to say, I don't know, and this stinks, and I'm not um, feeling like I have it all together. I don't have it all together. I'm a mess, and that's okay. And um, to sort of share in each other's messes and to help each other wrestle well is community and it's life-giving and it can happen on any stage of our life. Like I don't have to have the answer to the question before I present the question to somebody else or even just say, I don't know, but here's what I know about God in the midst of that. And I think that um, we all are as wounded healers um, should just give each other, you know, freedom in order to, to walk through our journeys well. And we don't have to be in a specific place and we don't have to have it all together. The inciting incident has been much more of an invitation because I feel that every day is an invitation to accept that journey or to run from that journey. And I've made both of those decisions depending on the day, but some days I don't have it in me um, to keep moving forward and to keep obeying and to keep following. And some days I have that, I have that desire, I have that strength. And, um, and that's why, that's why I'm in the middle of the story. I, I can't say these are the results. This is how it ended. Because one day feels like victory and one day feels like failure. And I just keep going back and forth and back and forth. But that, that's the story that I feel God is writing for me and I'm being asked to follow.
I know that there are stories of miracles, and I hear these stories of um, being, you know, addictions and other things being swept away in a moment. Um, I hear more stories where that hasn't happened. And uh, life is a process, and uh, the Christian walk is truly a journey. It's um, being renewed in Christ every single day. And I think that we have this idea that if it doesn't happen quickly or if it doesn't happen in a moment, um, that it's not happening. But my experience is that it is happening, but it's happened really slowly, really slowly. That experience of turning around, which happened in college, has really marked what became my uh, career in, in early adulthood. And so after I graduated from college, I uh, traveled for a while and, and did some mission work and then eventually uh, joined a, a mission organization. And my job for the past six years has been helping mobilize young people to have experiences like I had, where they have an opportunity to face poverty uh, or uh, pain or, or suffering, some sort of need that they have an opportunity to meet. And so instead of turning around, um, they're, they're in uh, a location in an area where they are forced to depend on God and hear His voice and respond in obedience to whatever He's calling them to do. Tracy Persico is using the wounds in her past to reach out to others, to be the wounded healer. Jeff Goines still hears the words of the man on the bridge and continues to help others turn around and catch a vision for a hungry world. David Wenzel is still telling stories, still helping others, and his tumor is still there. To end our program, here is another reflection from Blaine Hogan, Blaine says he still deals with panic attacks. He calls it the body's alert, a red flag, the check engine light of the soul. He doesn't try to run from the panic anymore. Instead, as he works at Willow Creek Community Church in a northern suburb of Chicago, he tries to pay attention to those signals. He tries to ask what's going on inside and where God might be leading him, moving him toward himself in unexpected ways. His final thoughts may help you as you think about how you're responding to your inciting incident. Earlier this winter, I went on a retreat with my very best friend, Jared. On the final day of our trip, I began thinking of how my anxiety, still sometimes very present, is working itself through my story. I started wondering how after six years, my brokenness might still be repaired. Curled up in a rattan chair made of birch, I wrote this. February 22nd, 2012. I'm sitting on the back porch of a glorious cabin in the far northwestern woods of Arizona. The sun is bright as it passes through the tall, skinny evergreens. It pushes past the guards standing at attention, their shadows steadily growing. Today, the storm is raging inside me, and yet the sun is breaking through. In between the shadows, the light hits the snow. It shines and it sparkles. The beams bounce off the white sheet lying on the ground and warm my face. I'm still in recovery, and most certainly will always be, but today, there is no glass on the snow, neither from my window nor from my heart. It seems the pieces are being put back together. The sun echoes off the snow, leans in close, and whispers softly, He is making all things new. And I'm starting to believe that might be true. Find out more about these stories and more at moodyradio.org.